the right to leave. Uh, we are about to start officially, but we are still waiting for a couple of our panelists to join uh, on Zoom. So please stay around. We are about to have a quite interesting conversation about the impact of the US sanctions on Cuba with a set of extremely uh, knowledgeable and uh, important um, panelists here in Havana and also abroad. So please stay with us. In a couple of minutes, we will be starting this panel. Thank you.
Hi, hello everyone. Thank you so much for waiting. Uh, we are connected from Havana. Thank you for joining us in this webinar, Right to Live Without a Blue Paint. This is sponsored by Oxfam and the uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Center. Thank you so much for joining us. We are on YouTube, we are on Facebook, we are on Zoom, and we're about to have quite an interesting discussion with several panelists from uh, different parts of the world and, of course, here in, in Havana. When the world is being impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the priority of all countries should be to save lives, to, to treat diseases, and to mitigate the effects of the economic crisis. Unfortunately, these countries make the economic crisis and are qualified into Locate and known in the, in the United States and the world. We have a phrase in Cuba that we repeat time and again. Uh, it's called, we would say, not as fast or it's not easy. And that's because in Cuba, indeed, a lot of things are harder uh, than it should be. Putting aside the internal problems that we do have, a lot of them. Uh, in Cuba, importing equipment to improve productivity or agriculture or using Zoom. These, these, uh, one of the uh, apps that we're using now, uh, online services, uh, is harder or even impossible because uh, because of the sanctions. I have lived my entire life under the blockade. I became a mom in the context of tightening of the sanctions, and it is safe to say that uh, the blockade has really impacted not only my life and the lives of a lot of humans, but it has been even harder and harder on those with some sort of priorities, including people living with disabilities. And this is why Oxfam has commissioned this report right to live without a blow a document that shows how the US uh, policies cause real damages that obstructs the ability of Cuban citizens uh, to access basic products and prevents them from enjoying basic human rights. And we are honored today with several panelists who will be able to explain this and we'll listen to them first and afterwards we'll have time for your questions so please stay with us on facebook youtube or zoom because we will have uh we will read some of your questions and our panelists will uh, answer them we thank the presence of and it will be great if the camera now opens so you can see the panel that we have here in in havana uh, we welcome Elena Gentili. she's the office personality in Cuba, she will be presenting the main arguments of this report. Uh, we have online from the US, uh, Elena Showalski, she's a writer and a social activist with a very peculiar and interesting relation with Cuba. Thank you so much, Elena, for joining us, for waiting. And also here from Havana, we are, uh, we thank the presence of Liliana Triana, she's the CEO of All Wives, the private uh, a company that provides audience management as well as production services. And we also thank Reverend Isset Sama. You uh, all Isset Sama, thank you so much for being here as well. Pastor of the Presbyterian Church of Los Palos in the western province of Mariaweke to the east of Havana. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you guys for being online, for staying around and participating with your comments, please share this link to the friends that you think might be interested in this conversation. We will listen now to Elena Gentili, she's been here uh, several years, she knows Cuba well, and she will be explaining why Oxfam, uh, the organization that she represents here in Cuba, decided to uh, commission this report. Why Elena, why now? and why a particular and differentiated focus on women and global groups. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being part of this space, for the debating this very relevant issue. Exactly, the question is why, but um, it's very important to say that uh, it's not the first time that Oxford stands against the embargo against the blockade. This is uh, the first time we are uh, raising a record um, because we, we believe it's very urgent to expose uh, the uh, human dimension, the human face of, of the impacts of these uh, this sanctions against Cuba, who is actually affected by the blockade, is 
the people is more than 11,000, 11 million people living in the country. So we have um, we have mission at this uh, this great book to uh, expose how through testimonies, through the, the, the actual testimony of people, mostly women, these uh, the sanctions are impacting the daily life of, of women mostly, uh, but of, of, on the people, on the Cuban population in its overall, by um, coercive unilateral sanction that is affecting the country and the society since about six decades. But again, why Optum now? Optum is present in the country since about half of the six decades, since 27 years. So during these 27 years, we've been able to work closely with the multiple actors, different actors, um, close to people, to the communities. And doing so, we've been able to be a uh, witness on, on how the blockade and the embargo is actually affecting it. The, the, the opportunities for development of people projects uh, and women projects as a development organization um, working to end injustice and poverty, we can actually say that almost 60 years of course during our future have uh, impacted in the opportunities that Cuban people have to achieve their own goals to realize their own projects and we are asking like what if what what could be different for the lives of these more than 11 million people without the limitation and the impact of of this uh, of this restriction and even more for uh, an international organization um, we have realized in the last year and even more than a year how the digital platform has been crucial for exchanges for you know, increasing own knowledge and so on. And we know we actually have some millions of delays in our uh, in, in our event today because we know how difficult or even impossible it is for people to access to these uh, digital uh, platforms. And then again, as a rights-based organization committed to fighting um, inequality and promoting gender justice. We are working in Cuba as one with the national and, net and local organization uh, to close the, the gender gap. Why? Um, broadly speaking, and at international level, global level, we believe that to build a just society, women, every woman and girl, have to have the possibility to fully self determine their lives mm, and their opportunities um, in order to address. This, in order to really achieve a just society where women and girls can fully self determinate its own decisions and its own uh, life, we need to recognize the problem. We need to identify what policies, but also practices, are restricting and limiting their potentials. And this is why we are saying that the blockade is reinforcing the patriarchal system, this is affecting mostly women in this context, in the Cuban context. Why? Because it doesn't recognize the different needs, the different potential and opportunities and the autonomy of women. So we are committed, even in the program in Cuba, for a, an empowerment, in a greater empowerment of Cuban women it is a central core of our um, activities, projects, and programs together with our partners here. We, we, we say it in, in, in Spanish, el liderazgo transformador de las mujeres, no? uh, which means that uh, the, leader, the transformative leadership of women. Well, we do believe that without these obstacles that the blockade um, imposed them, they could have more opportunity to achieve this leadership, this transformative leadership, and exercise their full enjoyment of, of their rights. So we have also another aspect that may Oxfam, um, let's say, able to, to raise this issue and uh, and to release this report to, to make everyone, uh, you know, more um, aware of the kind of impacts that this 60, the almost 60 years of, of blockade is causing to the, to the Cuban population. Also, in Cuba also works uh, for the humanitarian responses. 
And amongst others, like the impact of the climate change, Europeans did with a couple of years ago, we are committed and we, since more than one year, we're supporting Cuba in the response to the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So even in this case, we've been witness on how the US embargo is limiting the access to poor Chinese needed inputs, uh, medicines, technologies, to fully uh, respond to the uh, to this uh, horrible disease that has impacted the global level uh, and to protect lives, which has been the core strategy for the Cuban response to the, um, to the pandemic. Oxfam broadly at global level is calling for a people vaccine that is free and accessible as soon as possible everywhere to everyone. We know that Cuba is developing five different vaccine candidates, two of which are at the late stages of, um, of trials. So how the embargo, even in this condition, in this context, is an obstacle to the Cuban response to this pandemic and even to the Cuban um, development of these uh, candidates. Um, so we we see how these multiple challenges that Cuba has to face are not only due to the uh, commercial limitation and restriction with the US because the blockade has an extraterritorial nature which limit the possibility of Cuba to even purchase these basic needs and these equipments from other countries and other uh, suppliers. And it's not affecting only Cuba, it's affecting the organization, international organization as, as Oxfam as well, in order to support uh, this response uh, because of financial restrictions um, and also because of the uh, needed identification of certain suppliers. Anyway, um, we really believe that now in the context of a global pandemic uh, is, is needed a urgent action to normalize the relations between the US and, and Cuba and immediately suspend those measures of the blockade that is in, are impeding the uh, timely acquisition of any material and inputs um, that is actually hold holding the possibility of Cuba to have a massive vaccination campaign. I want to thank um, the words uh, that have been raised in the prologue of, um, of our report because they, they really got the essence of this report. How the simplistic understanding of the Cuban reality are actually limiting the Cuban people in exercising their rights and in realizing their dreams. Um, the report wants and aims to amplify the voices of Cuban people, Cuban women, for demanding for a, a world we like, for dignity. And you will see in the report that we have several testimonies. We have several testimonies here with us as well. Uh, they will share with us really how in the daily life of women and, and men in Cuba, uh, the blockade is, uh, is limiting their opportunities. So um, Oxfam has uh, accompanied the, the, the Cuban people since 1993 in order to support um, their initiative to boost for a more resilient, a more inclusive and just society. For this, Christina, we, we really believe that it's important to recognize and address the economic inequalities and also uh, those inequalities that could emerge in, as a consequence of the current transformation uh, that are um, coming before the new constitution approved in 2019 um, that, that is already uh, enforced. So we understood the need to continue promoting and reorienting local potential towards a new and more dynamic economic activities such as non-agricultural cooperatives and small and medium enterprises. Uh, Cuba is leaving the um, the deepest economic crisis uh, from the last 30 years. So we do believe that this uh, 
very important lifting the globe aid and these sanctions because it will directly benefit the individual um, for their domestic, domestic uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, changes that are already on the way, as, as we were saying, to increase economic opportunities, mostly for women, and to multiply the possibility of a participatory citizenship and a constructive dialogue. So often call upon the UN uh, member states because, for example, in a few in a few weeks on the 23rd uh, June, on 23rd June, we will uh, will see the uh, the resolution against uh, the blockade on Cuba at the uh, UN General Assembly. We call for all UN members uh, to support this resolution as well, um, as well as uh, uh, listening. Today's uh, testimonies that are not only from Havana. We thank uh, all the partners that have supported um, the, the development and the elaboration of this report because they cover all sectors education, academic, the health sector. Um, because there are so many different reasons to advocate for lifting the UN's blockade, particularly in the context of a global pandemic when avoiding a deeper economic crisis and protecting people is the most urgent issue and is a shared responsibility. So I'm very happy we will have the opportunity today to hear from, from all of us and from who has uh, and who had the direct experience on, on what we have been able to show and share in, in our work. Thank you, Elena. So we think that uh, we have now the opportunity of seeing a video about how rural women live the market. Let's listen to it. las mujeres tenemos y desarrollamos todos los días una capacidad inventiva y una capacidad de resiliencia y de adaptación a los cambios que tenemos que enfrentar. Desde mis inicios laborales hasta vinculada en el sector agropecuario. poner una manguera, poner un pedazo de cóctel, un pedazo de nail, lo vuelve a unir y aún así mira la fuga de agua que tenemos. La agricultura lleva un deterioro continuo y junto con ella incluso un deterioro del medio ambiente. Es uno de los sectores más golpeados por el bloqueo. Comercializar con los países de América Latina siendo un mercado tan cercano se nos hace imposible prácticamente debido a la característica extraterritorial que tiene el bloqueo. Si no existiera el bloqueo, el índice de productividad y el índice de rendimiento aumentaría. La economía no solo se afecta a nivel nacional, afecta a nivel personal cada una de las casas donde vivimos. Tengo 31 años y hace 60 años vivimos bajo las injustas leyes que nos impone un bloqueo que intenta asfixiarnos. We thank again those of you who are online. Uh, we are in, a, in the webinar Right to Live Without a Global Hate, commissioned by Oxfam. Um, thank you, Elena for your initial words on the report. The report, by the way, is uh, available online. You can download it in Spanish and in English if you want to read it, or if you are a journalist and you want to cover. Um, at the beginning of, of this webinar, that, that you're listening to is that we are in Havana, so you might be listening to some background noise. We excuse yourself for that. Uh, also, I forget to mention why this webinar is in English. Uh, as you know, the U.S. sanctions on Cuba uh, are codified into law in the United States and our purpose is to uh, tell the story of how the sanctions are laid by ordinary Cubans 
um, to the American people that hasn't, hasn't had the opportunity of understanding and seeing by themselves why this is a policy that doesn't only or uh, doesn't only affect the human government as is the narrative from some boys in the United States and why this is a problem for the human people and that's why this uh, webinar is in English although we do have translation uh, and you can change to Spanish if you prefer so uh, again, thank you for staying, staying with us. Also, thanking all the organizations that made this possible, this sort of technological uh, enterprise and endeavor in this country is extremely difficult. So, we thank all the people that have worked so intensely for several days to make this happen so we can bring this story of tool with data and voices in this report to all of you uh, who are not here in Cuba. Uh, Elena Schwalski, thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, Elena has a tremendously interesting story with Cuba. She came to this country in 1972, uh, started a work brigade, and then she was thrown back in the 90s, and she worked in the front line of the HIV pandemic in this country. She wrote a book on Cuba, a beautiful book on Cuba, in Cuba called Waking in Havana. And she understands the story of ordinary humans, specifically healthcare workers uh, who have dealt with living in the context of, of, of sanctions and how this impacts how they work. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, you are uh, quite an interesting witness of how the global is seen and lived in Cuba. How have you seen the global effect both your patients while you worked in Cuba and caregivers? And in particular, have you seen women particularly affected, differentiated, have even a differentiating part of the embargo? Thank you for being with us, Elena. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me to participate in this really important event. And thanks to Oxfam, I think by producing this report, you've given us a really valuable tool in our struggle to end the U.S. blockade against Cuba once and for all. So, um, you know, in 1996, I lived with a Cuban family in Havana, and I was working in the AIDS sanatorium on the outskirts of the city. And that was a time when Cuba was in a severe economic crisis due to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And at that time, the U.S. actually tightened the blockade. Um, and made it even more difficult. And so for, for patients and people living with HIV AIDS in the sanitarium and those who cared for them, um, it was the blockade was really a life and death issue at that time. Um, it was almost impossible for Cuba to get medications even though they had made a commitment to make those medications free and universally available to all people living with HIV and AIDS. And this was due to the blockade, which effectively prohibited uh, US pharmaceuticals and, and those around the world from selling these drugs to Cuba. And as an AIDS activist and a nurse at that time, we collected medications from patients in the US who had died. Their families gave us their, their medications and we brought them to Cuba. And that was the way that in the beginning, many Cubans with HIV and AIDS were able to survive uh, the epidemic. In this moment, um, Cuba has, biotech industry has developed so rapidly and is able to produce the medications on the island, but it is still um, very difficult to obtain the raw materials that are needed because the trading partners are so distant and the expense is so great. So although Cuba makes these medications available freely as part of their universal healthcare system, um, there are still many patients who are only who are not able to obtain the most advanced newest generation of medications. And this greatly affects their, um, their care and their treatment and their, and their life. Um, I, I, my dear friend, Maria Julia Fernandez, who was a founder of the AIDS prevention group at the sanitarium that do, does prevention work around the island, um, 
was Cuba's one of Cuba's first AIDS patients and one of the first residents in the sanatorium. And she was a fierce advocate for the rights of the patients there um, and, and was very responsible, I think, and made a huge contribution to the evolution of Cuba's AIDS program um, to be what it is today, which is a, the sanatoriums exist as a place for education and to learn how to live with the disease, but the pro, uh, primary care doctors throughout the island are delivering the care. Um, unfortunately, uh, after decades of living with HIV and being cared for, uh, despite great hardships, um, she uh, got ovarian cancer and, um, and died in 2015. And during that time that she was suffering with cancer, although she was receiving treatment in Cuba with chemo and radiation, she would ask me to bring things like Tylenol, antacids, nutritional supplements, things that just weren't available in Cuba. Um, she died in 2015, as I said, and I often wonder what her life would have been um, without these deprivations and hardships imposed by the blockade. Um, I also saw women um, in the family that I live with and that I remain very close to, you know, the intergenerational effect on women where much of the very hard work of maintaining a household falls on the abuelas. Um, <laughs> who look forward to relaxing, but really can't because everybody else is, you know, working so hard just to get to work and working long days at work just to make ends meet. And so women are carrying the burden of caring for the sick, of caring for the elderly, of childcare, and of maintaining a household. Um, and, and it's exhausting. And uh, during the various moments when I've lived and worked in Cuba, I've always felt tremendous shame and really fury at this policy that uh, the US government imposes on the island. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that <laughs> you'd like me to say about that. I, I would like to talk a little bit about the impact of the blockade on those of us who live in the United States <laughs> because I think um, sometimes we only think it affects the Cuban people and it certainly does affect them in ways that are so... Uh, Could you please go over that idea of how, how you leave the, the sanctions from there? Because obviously we only see this, this side of, of the story. And also, uh, would you go over what, what do you think it needs to, to change in the US policy in order for Cubans to most effectively tackle the pandemic? Could you right. please address those two issues? Sure. So um, one of the ways that I think we, we don't often talk about the way the sanctions and the blockade affect those of us who live and struggle and work <laughs> in the US. Um, and in the, in the late 2000s, I had the privilege of working with an organization called Medic and the, their community partnership for health equity. And I brought groups of residents of Claremont Village in the South Bronx in New York City to Cuba to learn how Cuba mobilizes its population and engages communities in their own health care. Um, and we visited family doctor programs, we visited clinics, we visited senior centers, um, and the residents who, this is uh, the 10,000 residents in a public housing development in the con congressional district with the lowest uh, per capita income in the US. Uh, and they went to Cuba and they were absolutely astounded by what they saw there. At the diabetes, the National Diabetes Center, for example, we learned about Herbaprot P, which is an innovative medication that Cuba has developed and is now being used in over 250,000 patients in 20 countries are able to access this medication uh, that Cuba has developed that, that prevents diabetic foot ulcers from turning into amputation. And if you spend any time in Claremont Village in the Bronx, you will see on a bus, on the street, everywhere, so many people in wheelchairs because of amputations due to 
diabetes. The rate of type 2 diabetes is extraordinarily high in that neighborhood. It's very hard to eat healthy food and exercise, all kinds of barriers. And the, Cuba, and the people from Claremont that we brought, which included doctors from the hospital and residents of the development, said, this is, a, this is amazing. Why can't we use this in Claremont? Why can't we have this in our clinics and our hospitals? This would have such an impact on the quality of life for our residents. And the only answer and the simple answer and the terrible answer is because of the blockade. So we are losing so much in the US in terms of now as the pandemic is unfolding, another example, in my immigrant community, the government agencies were completely unorganized and the response was completely inadequate. And we had to form volunteer mutual aid committees to help people get food, to help people get vaccines, to help people get tested. And at the same time watching Cuba mobilize 28,000 medical students to go door to door and screen people to start a testing program, to develop vaccines, even though I know those as well are hampered by the blockade, um, was just inspiring. And we could learn so much from exchanges that no longer can happen because of the tightening of the travel restrictions. Um, so that's one way that I feel the blockade really hurts us. And in terms of what we can do, I'm really hopeful right now because I think that in this country, in the, U, in the US, excuse me, a conversation has been opened about health and public health and what should we expect from, from our public health system as never before. And so I'm hoping that that will open a way to a dialogue about how the blockade is one of the most, um, one of the most terrible examples of how the lack of health cooperation affects us all. We need global health cooperation in this moment as never before. And I think people are starting to see that. And I think that we can use that to build a stronger movement against the blockade in the US. And as a nurse and as a community activist, I certainly intend to do whatever I can to contribute to that. We're seeing on a local level, city councils, I think it's 14 cities now in the US that have um, passed resolutions against the blockade and calling for health cooperation since the pandemic. And I think we need to build on that. And I think we need to strengthen that. And I think we need to use the pandemic and the realization that people have come to as a result of it to really build this movement against the blockade. You mentioned the Freedom to Export to Cuba Act also provides an opportunity, but I think organizing on a local level, which is so strong now and it's so necessary, has become almost necessary for survival in our cities, um, will help us build that movement. So I hope that's a helpful response. Thank you so much, Elena, uh, for your words. Please stay around. We might have some questions afterwards, and you can listen to uh, the other panelists. Thank you, all of you who are online. We're going to write here live your questions. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you that are online all around the world. Please uh, to this webinar, we are going to listen now the experience of a young woman, mom, uh, and the CEO of her own company, uh, Four Wives. She challenges every day the patriarchal system. Uh, this deals with having a private uh, company in, in Cuba, uh, in spite of how far it is in terms of. of of, of the impact of the sanctions for wives, eh, which is the work also of another part of women, is one of the countries that was founded and thrived in the years of the reproachment between the Cuban government and the US government uh, during the Barack Obama's administration. Uh, it benefited from many artists and celebrities that came here and for wives provided services 
uh, we can go uh, for this. Lilia, thank you so much for being with us. Can you tell us a little bit how have these sanctions in Cuba limited the scope of your business? Yes, of course. Thanks for the invitation. I think I was telling the panelists that maybe the main part was my English. I haven't practiced in two years, so sorry for that. Um, first of all, I'll say that um, with all this event and uh, film industry and music industry that was coming to Cuba from the US, it happened to, to gain our main market at some point. And after the first Trump revelations, uh, they started to stop coming. And they had fear of legal repercussions. We lost around, I don't know, 13, 15K, $15,000 in business we have uh, running. We had uh, big banks interested to come to Cuba. We, we had started the ODA negotiations with the culture ministry and everything. And they stopped all the, the relations when called. When called from one day to the other, we stopped uh, hearing from them. We, they didn't answer the phone. It was really like it was that was um, a really painful moment for the company. Nevertheless, I would say it was a challenge. And How did you overcome that challenge? I, I we, we like to, to see the things from the positive side. And we were looking to the external market, the US market which we still do, but we, we didn't look at the, at the potential of the national market. And we, so we turned to the national market, we start working with Cuban companies, we start working with Cuban festivals, which we do, which we did with um, the Film Festival, for example, but we start working with another festival as we start working with um, Cuban companies doing publicity. And yeah, we, we reinvent ourselves. We reinvent ourselves in a way, yeah. Is it all that the, 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 the fact that you had to uh, learn how to make it in a context uh, different from that in which you were born as a company? Because uh, through Trump's administration, Cuba has seen over 240 different measures which have made the system of sanctions more comprehensive and a, a very, very uh, broad in its scope. Um, you've reinvented yourself, but as a Cuban woman entrepreneur among Cuba, uh, which by the way, for wives and employs other people. And so they, they, they've seen their income affected by this. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you see, how do you leave this sort of, of, of situation in which, uh, from a context, we, like 2015, 2016, there was a lot of hope and a lot of uh, positive vibes that actually good neighboring was possible between the two countries so much that business like yours thrive in this context. But now the situation is even worse than it was before, right? Plus in terms of how uh, big and, and, and the ramifications of the measures the Trump administration has taken on Cuba. How, how is that expressed in your daily life? It's difficult, uh, but still we are we're happy to overcome all this challenge. I mean, it's difficult. You need to, you cannot plan ahead, never in Cuba, because you don't know how it will be. That's kind of hard. That's kind of hard. hard. <laughs> That's kind of hard. Yeah, but still, um, 
you can have into you can you have to take into account different scenarios and you have to play with that. It's difficult during the pandemic being among having to and I'm talking for all our members um, having to to pay wages to people because you cannot let people down. So you have to you have a responsibility with with your workers and you still have to maintain that and, and support and support them. Uh, it's hard to get supplies to, to get the company running. It's hard to access to technology that sometimes you need. It's, it's hard to connect to platforms, for instance, or add uh, one code also. So, so you, your, your business runs in a context completely different from any other business or small company. Or a small enterprise that is in any other part of the world. So your context is more challenging, it's different, and requires more resilience for you guys. I'm not asking, I'm, I'm connecting. <laughs> so if you are more resilient, you have to be more resilient, there's no other way. Yeah, we are. Uh, I mean, uh, at this point, it's not the problem. I mean, we, we have that to, to live like that, and, and now it's like, you have to deal with it. You have to deal with it. And, and, and look at small. <laughs> how does does how, how does your life, your daily life, is being impacted by pandemic and economic crisis, tightening of the sanctions, no travels, shortages of basically anything? How how is your life impacted? It's hard to deal with it in a daily basis because you have like peaks and you there. Days that you say, okay, everything will be okay, and you have to have this to do this. But you have two kids at home because I, I have my, my partner's um, daughter, so I have two kids at home. You have to work with them there, you have to deal with all the sharpness, as you said. You have to think, okay, I need to buy all these supplies today for the house, for the company. Uh, I need to have a video call with some client. Uh, we need to organize the enterprise with the kids at home. What all this struggle of the the tech pandemic, the located the country in place. So, uh, Lilian, at the same time, uh, I think that the experience of the wives is the experience of. Uh, of the opportunities that the current uh, legal framework the country has for private businesses to thrive. So this is this a problem was impossible to think of so the existence of a business like the wives had not taken 15 years ago. Uh, and this is an example of how uh, even the individual entrepreneur, the, 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 the private worker has had to reinvent itself. Uh, to be able to deal with sanctions and put on a, a great face like you do every day, you know, and reinvent in order to do have successful business in this country, which uh, is an example that is possible. But again, I'd like to go back to what Elena said at the beginning uh, what if four wives would have uh, been founded in a different context or in a context in which sanctions were not reality? How big it would be, and how important and relevant your work would have been if you would have been born in the context of, of, you know, of those countries. They have a comment that. Yeah, I think it would be amazing. I would like to, to see that. I would like to try it. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see it. I, I, would, I, would, I, I really would like to feel the adrenaline, to know that adrenaline, that having. A lot of clients, a lot of business, a lot of things running at the same time and without restriction. Thank you so much, Lilian. Stay around. We have, we're getting a lot of questions and comments from people watching on uh, on Zoom. Uh, thank you, all of you that are that are online. We want to thank also the presence of 
he said Sama, Reverend, and he's going to be here. I'll just tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she graduated as a nurse first, and then she became a pastor and parenting precious in the Presbyterian Church of Los Palos in the western province of Guayabeque. This is to the east of Havana. Uh, she has a long and extensive, extensive work with low-income communities and rural areas for several years. Uh, and that's why she can bring a very interesting perspective on how these parts of, of the country, because we inevitably sometimes in Arabic about the sanctions, is a very urban uh, narrative. That's why we uh, show you this video about rural uh, at the beginning of our webinar, as part of your work, uh, he said, This is not uh, this is your story, it's not a story you told from a comfortable distance. We do live in the community, we witness the adversities that people are and you due to the sanctions. Is in their daily lives with the people that you interact with, how are they affected by US policies against Cuba? Do you see big repercussions for women?
Hi, thank you for being around. Uh, we had trouble with our technological platforms. This is the cost of doing things from a country that is banned from so many uh, apps and services online because of the sun. This is an example of why this country lives in a differentiated complex because of the sanctions. Uh, we had online, I'm not quite sure if she's still around, uh, uh, Dr. Elena Duman, the special rapporteur. Uh, I'm, I'm not right now seeing her online. We had her as one of our panelists. Uh, we weren't clear if she was able to fit us in her schedule. But if she's around, we would love to listen to her perspective as a published and authorized voice in international law on the impact of unilateral coercive measures uh, on, on, on different countries, not only in Cuba, as she has written and researched and witnessed the impact uh, in different countries of the world. Also in Cuba, she's quoted in our report as an authorized voice on this. Could we, is she online? Could we see uh, all the people that are online? Yeah. No. 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 Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, okay, so she's in another meeting for the moment. This is the pandemic times in which we are on Zoom the time. Uh, but if, if she can come back later, we will listen to her for the moment. We continue with the um, intervention. We were listening to what we said, Sama, uh, uh, Al Guman, the Reverend, he said, he is, is a pastor uh, in, in the Presbyterian Church in a rural community here in Havana, in, near Havana, in a province called Mayae, to the east of Havana. And we were listening to how the daily life the people that interact with, he said, uh, is, is, is affected, is impacted in any way because of the sanctions. How is this related in every, every day's lives uh, of the people that you interact with in, in, in your community as well? Yes, I was talking about how difficult it is the dining day for the people in Cuba, especially people who live in the countryside. Uh, my town, the small town that I live in, and I also working as a pastor have uh, about 8,000 people in the population. Um, many of the house, the, the women are the, 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 the heads of the households. They have to manage their daily life for children, for adults, for elder, for sick people. So it's very difficult. Uh, just because the access to medicine, the access to the meals, the, if you have to move, uh, the, the conversation is, is, is hard uh, uh, every day to try to, to, to live with all this uh, problem. I think that not only because the economical crisis that we have here in Cuba, and as everybody knows, uh, not only for the pandemic, uh, at this time, but also for the, in addition, we have the burden of the other sanctions that the U.S. has to So, I, I think that if you live as a Cuban family now and you see how difficult it is to obtain the, the quality of life because of all these sanctions, you also know that it's not only because of our problem, but for the, the sanctions that the U.S. government uh, have with our, our company. He said uh, there are people that say that this policy of, of sanctions, and this is uh, a comment that we've seen from different voices, uh, essentially I think the report was published uh, on this week on Tuesday in the press conference in the report was published. And then there's this narrative that's been repeated over the years that the purpose of the blockade is to force a change in the political system in Cuba, uh, to force a change. It doesn't matter if in a way the lives of thousands of people 
are limited, are affected, including uh, children living with disabilities, people that need some medicine or technology to survive, and this is not even possible because of the sanctions. So it's the, it's, the, it's the will of a group, of a very powerful group of people trying to impose a quite disproportionate power on another country just to pursue a particular political change. If in the way the lives of human beings are, are affected, that doesn't seem to be a problem. You're a woman of faith, you bring love, you bring social work, you bring awareness uh, to your community. How do you see this? I think that nothing justified to hurting or affecting the people because you think that is the way to have the institution a better life. No matter if you are against or in favor of the government, the problem against the, the, the human that now is affected because of this problem. When you when you saw the people uh, in the struggle that the people have to, 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 to live every day um, as a as a person of faith, we we believe in God, in God gives us a life. So the plenty of life means that you have the opportunity to live the way that you decide to live. So how you can tell me that you want to help me because it's the better for me when you decide to hurt me or, or affect me in many ways. So it's impossible to, to see that, that, that this is the way to help a, a car, a country, or whatever you want to do. So, so I, I can't believe that someone thinks as a human being that when you decide to affect other people, is because you want to give these people a better life. So it's true that we have many things inside to fix, but I think that we have to do as a as a human people. No, no one can tell us how we we can do that. Uh, it's true that we have many problems here, many uh, ways to do the thing better. But in addition, you're going to give more problems, your damage is crazy. I think that uh, for me and for the church, that we have to, to try to, to support the people in all this uh, problem that we have now. It is, it is it's too strong to think that someone wants to give us some good in this way. So, uh, just see the people, the children, the women, the elders, the people who have special needs. How, how you can tell this? Just wait now, because in the future, the thing become better. It's impossible to, to feel that this is the best for us. Thank you so much, Reverend. Uh, we are just uh, coming to an end of this webinar in which we listened to the voices of three women, four women, uh, talking about how the sanctions impact the lives of Cubans in general, but how the sanctions uh, do have a differentiated impact on, 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 on vulnerable groups, specifically uh, women. The, the report, The Right to Live Without a Blockade, uh, is was commissioned by Oxfam. You can download it in English and Spanish from Oxfam website, uh, Oxfam Cuba website. And I just want to, before uh, saying goodbye, I just want to give you my personal experience on how, as a young woman that chooses to live uh, in Cuba uh, in times of pandemic, sanctions, and economic crisis all of that together. My entire life has been confined. Uh, by the limits uh, of, of, of the market. But now I would like to know how the, these unilateral measures that have marked my life are illegal, are, uh, are misused, and are violating the international law. I, I have a report uh, now that two other panelists that we've been waiting for are now connected. 
uh, I believe so. Um, are they around? We, we've been waiting for Reverend Hugh Winkler from the United States and Alena Dunham, the special rapporteur uh, on unilateral coercive measures. Uh, we've been uh, waiting for both of them. I don't know if they're around. So I, I, I listen, I, I can now we are connected with Jim Winkler. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, and it's great that you're around. Uh, Reverend Winkler is the President and General Secretary of the National Council of the Churches of Christ in the United States. And he has been quite uh, uh, vocal on expressing his criticism his rejection to the policy of aggression and hostility to the United States. As a matter of fact, he sent a letter to the US House of Representative Nancy Pelosi uh, rejecting the inclusion of Cuba in the special watch list of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. Reverend, again, thank you for being with us. What has led you and the National Council of Churches to call for this change in US policy? What uh, part of the sanctions uh, have you and your colleagues seen that those concern you? Thank you. Thank you for Oxfam for this report. Uh, the National Council of Churches in the USA has called for the removal of the blockade since uh, 1968. And we uh, are continuing to push the US government to, uh, to move forward, to remove uh, and re uh, to, to reverse the Trump policies so that we can uh, resume the process uh, that took place under uh, President Obama to move toward normalization of relations. This has been a long, difficult, frustrating struggle over these many years. We uh, have always remained connected to the Cuban Council of Churches. Uh, we've worked together to return, uh, for example, Elian Gonzalez to his family in Cuba. We have uh, worked for the uh, release of the Cuban Five. And we have uh, celebrated the reopening of the embassy in Cuba. Uh, we have been grateful that the Cuban government uh, has been so um, uh, restrained in their response to Trump and have refused to take his uh, uh, to engage in a war of words with Trump. Uh, so I do believe that the Biden administration will resume uh, uh, and perhaps even go beyond what President Obama has done. But to end the blockade, that will require a vote in the US Congress, and that will be much more difficult to achieve. Uh, but we're, uh, we're grateful for the partners that we have here in the United States and in Cuba, uh, as we try to, uh, to really have normal relations between our two countries. This is long overdue. Was, were you able to hear me all right? Yes, yes, we, we, we heard you. Thank you so much. I wanted to do a follow-up, uh, Reverend. Um, what do you think, the context is different now, Donald Trump's administration imposed 240 measures or more, probably it's hard to count because it was over one measure a week. Um, the context is now, but what do you think it should change in the US policy to see, to, to help Cuba? Uh, tackle this pandemic in a more normal condition and not under sanctions that are that has only a political purpose. 
Well, of course, we need to reopen uh, uh, travel uh, re re between the two countries. We need to um, remove the uh, barriers uh, in terms of uh, uh, money going from uh, Cuban families in the US back to Cuba. We need for uh, tourism to resume from the United States. The actually the tourism opens the eyes of many Americans to the reality of Cuba. And they come home with a positive uh, uh, view of Cuba. The, the Obama policies were very popular in the United States. Uh, what I told the State Department is that um, even if President Biden were to follow Trump's policies, the people who support Trump will never support Biden. Uh, this is a uh, politically, it will be more popular for President Biden to uh, go back to the Obama policies and hopefully beyond them. We want uh, medical uh, and other supplies to go to Cuba. We want there to be support for the uh, Cuban medical personnel who work around the world. Uh, and uh, as I said, the most difficult part of this process will be a vote in Congress to end the blockade. Uh, right now, we have a bitterly divided country. As you know, just four months ago, there was an attempt to have a coup d'etat in the United States. So we are still attempting to, um, to bring our country together. Uh, and uh, so our challenge is not from the people of Cuba or the government from, of Cuba, it's from inside our own country. Is that helpful? Maybe we had a, our, our link has frozen again. Were you able to hear me all right? Okay. We are having an, an unstable internet connection, but we did listen to you. And uh, I think it's an extremely interesting point of view what you mentioned about how Biden uh, is still holding Trump's policies by not changing. Uh, and what's the impact that this could have in, in his constituencies. Uh, we would like to give the floor now, and thank you for joining us, a uh, special reporter on unilateral coercive measures from the UN Human Rights Council. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alena Mohan, for being uh, here with us uh, and feeding us in, in your week. illegal and misuse in the international community? Uh, good afternoon. So good morning for you. Unfortunately, I haven't heard the question. Uh, as far as the connection was not stable again. Uh, however, I, I, can repeat, I can repeat the question. Yes, you please. Can yes, please. So uh, why are you, thank you again for being with us. I don't know if you listen that. Uh, we are very happy to have, uh, to have you here with us. And we, we were talking about how important it is to understand why unilateral sanctions uh, are illegal and misused in the international community. And we wanted your perspective as an expert and, and an authorized voice on this that have witnessed and researched on this in so many countries. Why are unilateral sanctions illegal and misused in the international community? Thank you very much for the question. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for organizing this event. I was co-listening when the connection was stable from my side as well uh, during the whole event. And uh, upon my opinion, uh, I believe that I need to congratulate you with having a wonderful webinar when people are able to share not only the legalistic perspectives, but their real life stories. Uh, and uh, I will probably start from the point uh, the, that at the special rapporteur, uh, there is a huge need for the world community to know and to listen to real life stories. Because from my perspective, 
uh, as a special rapporteur after participating in a number of the political events like speaking to the Human Rights Council, to UN General Assembly, and even the UN Security Council, the main request usually comes uh, from the side of sanctioning states saying that you can never prove and you have no evidences that unilateral sanctions have negative humanitarian impact. And this part of the story is usually hidden from those who impose sanctions. And that's why it's necessary to collect this information to show up this information. Then when I come back to your question, I need to mention first of all that today, unfortunately, the scope of unilateral sanctions is expanding enormously. We are not speaking only about the traditional uh, style, the economic sanctions or economic or trade embargoes. The situation is even more complex now. Unilateral sanctions are presented in the style like something tiny, very targeted, uh, being imposed by good guys on the, with the purpose of common goods over the bad guys. And unfortunately, this presumption is very widespread. And that's why, again, real life stories and real facts are very important to explain what exactly is happening and what exactly is the legal status and humanitarian impact of unilateral sanctions. I'm very happy that you were asking the question about the legality of unilateral sanctions because being beside the special rapporteur, the university professor, I need to mention that there are very few, if any, academic works which try to provide any legal assessment of unilateral sanctions at all. You can find thousands of works devoted to the qualification of humanitarian impact assessment of UN Security Council sanctions. You may find thousands of works which are devoted to uh, the point how to increase effectiveness of the US or European Union sanctions, but you can hardly find any academic work which looks to provide a legal qualification of application of unilateral sanctions. There are very few ones. And therefore, for example, my report to the Human Rights Council this year is devoted exactly to identification what unilateral sanctions are, what is the difference between terms which are used to speak about unilateral sanctions, security measures, emergency measures, struggling against state sponsors terrorism, as it is the recent rhetoric towards Cuba as well, or any other types of measures. And to provide a general legal qualifications, what measures can be taken unilaterally by states and regional organizations or cannot. So the main scheme is pretty simple. So the first point is that states, generally speaking, can take certain unilateral measures if they are in conformity with international law. So states are free to choose whether they want to cooperate or do not want to cooperate with another state, whether they want to have diplomatic relation or not to have, or for example, if they want to conclude an agreement or they do not want to conclude the agreement. But if, for example, the international agreement is in force, a state can't quit fulfilling it today. There shall be an agreement regulated process of withdrawal from the international agreement, which will last at least one year for one year. Therefore, it's a slow process. It's very well regulated process. It can't be like in one clap today or tomorrow. The second point is that states also can take so-called countermeasures, but these countermeasures can only be taken in response to violation of international obligation by another state, by a directly injured state. So if there was an international agreement between states and it's violated by one party of the agreement and it affects rights of another party, this directly injured state can react can apply countermeasures, but they shall be proportionate and they shall never affect human rights. Even in the situations when, for example, there is a possibility to apply so-called collective countermeasures, these are very rare situation. They can only be used, for example, in the situation of the act of aggression or genocide or ethnic cleansing, for example. In this case, any state around the world can use countermeasures these measures can never involve the use of force, 
can never involve violations of fundamental human rights or humanitarian law, which is definitely not the case when we speak about application of unilateral sanctions today, including this style, which is used when we speak about Cuba. So therefore, theoretically, naturally, states always try to influence each other in the international relations. But what they can do shall only be done in accordance with international law. And when we speak, for example, about application of economic measures, there was an attempt to start a case in the WTO dispute settlement body by the European Union against the United States sanctions already in, late, in the middle of 1990s. So they finally came to the agreement how to eliminate the negative impact over the businesses of the European Union and the case was withdrawn. But in any specific case, when we speak about economic measures, the full scope of international obligations shall be observed. None of them can be violated and human rights shall never be affected. That's a very interesting point of view, uh, Ms. Suman. Uh, I, I want to have a follow-up. In the case of Cuba, how does the U.S. unilateral sanctions impact Cubans and specifically vulnerable people? In your experience, how 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 do you? Uh, what's your intake on this? Unfortunately, when one speaks about the application of unilateral sanctions against the country as a whole or against the specific sectors of economy or lots of businesses in the country, the impact of unilateral sanctions is usually very comprehensive. Uh, first of all, the economy of the targeted society is affected a lot. And that basically means that we speak not only about economy as such, but we speak about all the people dependent or involved into that economy. That means the unemployment rate, rate rises. It means that salaries are lower. That means that the poverty rate is rising again. We speak about the uh, lower possibilities of the targeted societies, including Cuba, to uh, have the possibility to buy the vital goods like medicine, medical equipment. At the very beginning of the pandemic, there were several very uh, cases uh, to which I reacted. I forwarded a communication toward the United States. And the very first one was about the impossibility of Swiss humanitarian organizations to deliver humanitarian aid already bought. That was a medical equipment and protective kits to deliver these protective kits and medical equipment to Cuba because it was blocked. And the second case was about the impossibility of um, uh, the owner of AliExpress to deliver humanitarian aid to Cuba in the course of the pandemic as well. Unfortunately, I received no response from the United States. But from the general perspective, so medicine, education, and all developmental projects are the areas which are affected the most and which are affected the first. Naturally, people who are vulnerable, and in this case, I'm speaking about children which have problems with visiting schools because they, some of them start to work, they, which have problems to get access to internet, which have problems of getting normal nutrition because the parents do not get sufficient money. Uh, we speak about the health sector. And as a result, people who uh, suffer from serious or chronic diseases are suffering a lot. There were cases cited about situations of people with oncology, with uh, uh, diabetes and so forth. So these people are affected a lot. Uh, female are affected a lot as well, because unfortunately, this is the group which loses money. First of all, and more unfortunately, when it comes to other countries, I'm not speaking about Cuba right now, there is an increasing rate of crimes committed inter alia against women uh, through involvement into prostitution or human trafficking or any other sorts of criminal activity as well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Duan. It's been a pleasure to listen to you, to have your voice, your experience, and your extensive uh, investigation research on these topics. We're going to move now to some questions that we've been receiving uh, online. Uh, one of the persons that is on our uh, chat on Zoom was asking a question on micro lending and how the Cuban government and uh, the Agriculture Institute 
institutions like the, the ministry uh, deals with, uh, with the rural communities and specifically women uh, that live in rural communities. And if micro lending is a reality, is a possibility in this country, Elena, uh, you've talked uh, to some of these authorities in several occasions. Oxfam, by the way, I didn't say this at the beginning. Oxfam is not commissioning and publishing this report from the distance, from a comfort distance. Oxfam has been in Cuba for many years, working with civil society organizations as well, as well as institutions accompanying Cuban people, and uh, knows the situation in this country and the many challenges, not all related to, to the sanction, of course, uh, but this, the challenges that this society deals with every day. In the case of, the, of this question of micro-lending and rural women, What's your experience with your dialogues with the Cuban voice? Well, uh, I will be brief because we are ready. <laughs> we have a very tight uh, schedule for everyone that is participating. But uh, I think it's a very important question and thanks for raising it. Um, as Christina was just mentioning, Oxfam has been working for several years on the ground, working with cooperatives and women and people, uh, especially in rural areas. Uh, but beside the on-the-ground work, we have been working with the Ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture, supporting the development of the, of the gender strategy, as well as um, supporting the development of the gender strategy of those organizations that are related to the Ministry of Agriculture. And this is a, um, a, a tool uh, in order to support women, and there is a political support in, in advancing the, the active participation of women. In, uh, in, in, in the, in the rural and agricultural sector. Besides that, from a legal point of view, we have to recognize that there is the 311 decree that is actually promoting access to land um, in, uh, in Usufer and uh, is, has a, a specific focus in supporting women uh, accessing the land. So I think these are the two main um, tools the gender strategy at the Ministry of Agriculture and within the organization, the civil society organization that are actually working on the ground with women and families and communities in developing the sector, but as well from the, um, from the legal point of view, there is this specific degree that is, uh, is supporting and um, increasing the, uh, facilitating the increasing access of women to, to land as well. Um, we do have time for the last question uh, uh, that he Probably said and help us uh, answer this. This is a question that comes from, uh, I thank you for being online, uh, on behalf of the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organization, passes to his parents. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, he, they, they, they have this question The Federation of Cuban Women is a major participant in the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. How do you think the U.S. blockade of Cuba will interfere and impact the ability of Cuban women to meet the highly critical 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development goals as outlined specifically in Section 12? Which states spark that the realization of those goals must take into consideration the different national realities? He said. Uh, I think that, I mean, so sometimes we talk about the, the, the how fighting a different kind of group, woman, children, but um, the, the special with that, I think that the, 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 all the programs who participate in all the, the expression of the woman in Cuba can give or can share with other people. This is part of the of the affecting the, the way that the human being can uh, develop her herself as a human being or also the human. We have experience in, in, in many different uh, ways uh, to, to help the development of the woman in Cuba. And how it's possible, it's possible, it's possible that we can't share with experience of experience with other people around the world, for example. Or how it's possible that we can we can have a history of development right for women in Cuba 
and it is possible to share this experience with other people, other women around the world, for example. Uh, not only from the, the Federation of Women, but for other organizations, also the church, the women, the organization, uh, women in the church, or other uh, group in the, in the society in Cuba. How is it possible that you uh, don't limit the opportunity to the woman to share all the experience and also to receive the experience of what the world in other the woman's in other country and other world. Thank you so much, uh, Isaac. So we are coming to an end of this webinar, rightly without a blog mate. Uh, we've been having uh, in three different parts of the world, uh, we have panelists here in Havana, and also we thank uh, the presence of Elena Schwalski, uh, Reverend Jim Winkler, and also uh, Dr. Elena Duman, uh, the special reporter of the unilateral course of measures who joined us um, on Zoom. Uh, we had here in this webinar voices that support uh, why this report commissioned by Oxford is so important. The voice of a private entrepreneur woman here in Havana, a reverend uh, working in rural communities, and people who understand how uh, harmful these sanctions are for the Cuban people uh, from uh, voices and uh, people that understand these policies and have seen the impact for years. My entire life has been confined by the limits of, of these, uh, the global influences. My life, my parents' life, and now my daughter's life, uh, life as well. Uh, this is something that I think of every time I have to cook food for my family or every time I have to get medicines for my role model parents. The economic limitations of the, of the sanctions are so broad that no production industry, a small enterprise, has been able to exist normally in this, uh, in this country. Uh, and of course, this calls back any economic development and, of course, hinders the empowerment of women that starts with uh, economic autonomy uh, and essential freedom to actually be able to challenge effectively the patriarchal system in which we live in. My life, my life as a mom, as a caregiver, uh, is of course harder because of the sanctions. It makes my professional self less prone to success uh, and to economic independence. And that's why it is safe to say that my human rights as a Cuban woman living in Cuba uh, are limited because of the sanctions. I, I just wanted to leave you with a final idea. The country that from where I'm talking to you from is, is full of potential. However, when you live under a siege and the sanctions are so broad and so extraterritorial, but you actually live in a besieged square, you barely expect survival. You demand less from yourself. And any risk or endeavor that you want to take to, to change, to reform uh, your, your reality is limited by the fact that you're constantly watched by a very powerful bully that is just watching you so you fail and it's working hard for you to fail. Uh, that's why the US administration has created such, uh, have created such a hostile environment that even the evolution of political dialogue in this country has been hindered hampered by the sanctions. I've been lucky enough to witness and cover as a journalist the reapproachment between the two governments and more importantly, the reapproachment between the two people. And um, that's why I can assure you that the benefits of being uh, neighbors and being together, of having bridges, of having a respectful dialogue, the benefits are mutual, are, are endless. Thank you so much for being around.